Bryce Miller has been stellar through his first two starts in the major leagues. He has absolutely electric stuff. But why isn't he getting any swing and miss at anything that isn't a fastball? Let's dig into the mystery of Bryce Miller. First off, Bryce Miller's fastball is absolutely incredible. He's getting about 20 inches of vertical movement on the pitch. This is often called carry or ride. Essentially, it means his ball is resisting the downward force of gravity more than you would expect, such that it stays maybe above the hitter's barrel a little bit, creates a lot of pop-ups, and also creates a lot of swing and miss underneath the baseball. It's sitting about 95 to 96 miles per hour as well, which is really important. Velocity matters a lot, so much so that Fangraph Stuff Plus thinks it's one of the best fastballs in MLB, giving it a 137, so 37% above the major league average four seam. It's the number two four seamer in baseball among starting pitchers next to only Spencer Strider. And the results are good on it too. He's generating a 29% swing and miss on the pitch, which is about seven percentage points above the average swing and miss rate for four seam fastballs. The expected WOBA or weighted on base average, which is essentially a way to encapsulate offensive production, bring in things like exit velocity and launch angle is 0 0.092, which is around 250 points below the league average for four seamers. And he throws it 70% of the time. Hitters know it's coming and they can't do anything about it. And I don't know what more do you need me to say. This thing is just absolutely bananas. The mystery of Bryce Miller begins when you factor in his other pitches. He's throwing what is tracked on baseball savant as a cutter, which is really just a gyroscopic slider. Essentially think bullet spin. Think about a football and how football spins around itself as it moves towards the plate or the rifling of a bullet coming out of a gun. It's really similar to what Logan Gilbert, his teammate throws. Gilbert started spiking his slider this year. So going to a spike grip and ripping the side of the ball to create again, that gyro spin, that football spin or bullet spin. And Bryce Miller also throws a sweeper, a sleep, sweeping slider which again is probably a two seam oriented grip right there. And he's ripping, probably cueing curveball, getting around the front of the ball, creating some top spin to set the axis. And the ball will take off laterally, get him around his 15 inches of sweep on the pitch. Again, very similar to what George Kirby, his teammate froze, who also started spiking his two seamer, two seam slider this year, and creating a bit more sweep on it. Been a really effective pitch for him. And the underlying stuff on the gyroscopic slider is great. It's 86 miles per hour. We can use our old adage and say that pretty much any slider above 85 miles per hour is gonna grade out well. And that's the case here. Fangraph Stuff Plus says this is a 114, so 14% better than the average cutter, so to speak. But I'm grouping into slider territory. The sweeper gets 16 inches of sweep and it's at 81 miles per hour. This is also great. Um, in theory, it is great. Fangraph Stuff Plus thinks it's about a 119, so it's a bit better than that cutter that much sweep at that velocity is very good. But he's thrown 47 in this gyro slider and sweeper, and he has only generated two swings and misses, which is astronomically low. It's shocking to me that he's able to have these two pitches and only generate that amount of swing and miss on it. The cutter is generating a little bit more swing and miss than the sweeper, which literally hasn't generated a swing and miss at the major league level. The x wobas on both these pitches are above 400, where you're expecting something to be maybe in the high twos, low threes. So again, 100 percentage points above the major league average. So the contact quality he's allowing isn't that great either. And you might be thinking, okay, it's a small sample of starts. This will correct in stuff plus, I believe. The problem here is that I got some double A data before he came up to the major league level. And we're looking at the exact same problem he's running into at the major league level. The sweeper got a 17% swing and miss rate in double A and the cutter or gyro slider got a 19% swing and miss rate at double A. Neither of those numbers are good. Both are well below the average for each of the pitch type. And that was against double A hitters who are objectively worse than major league bats. So what on earth is going on here? Theory number one has to do with Bryce Miller's release points. So Bryce Miller releases his four seam fastball from a height that's just below six feet. Two to three inches below that, you get his cutter or gyro slider. Five inches below the four seam fastball is where you get the sweeper. So what we're looking at is him essentially dropping his arm angle, manipulating his body to create these different shapes as opposed to releasing everything out of a very similar or negligibly different release point. And you generally don't see this in starting pitchers, in my opinion. I haven't run really the data on this, but anecdotally, you don't really see three inch to five inch differences in individual pitches among starting pitchers. If you do, it is in a curveball, generally where guys are maybe a little bit higher up in their slot and releasing and have a little bit of pop in that release to create downward break. But again, curveballs are kind of peripheral pitches, pitches that maybe steal strikes early in the count. Having two primary breaking balls in a pitcher released at this differential seems a bit odd. And you can see this in a few ways. The first being just a simple screen grab 
from a game of his recently against the Astros where you could see this differential here. You have four seam, you have cutter, and you have the sweeper. You could obviously tell there's the difference between these pitches. Also, in kind of maybe how he manipulates his body. And the other way you could look at this is simply just via a release point chart that shows the variance. So you could plot this on to him as a pitcher and see that based off the average releases for each of his pitches, you can see blue is the fastball, green is the gyro slider, red is the sweeper. There's a clear difference kind of between these pitches. The funny thing is that I actually think the consistency of a pitcher's release point is perhaps a bit overrated. And I've gotten this talking to coaches in and around the game that I think are pretty sharp, maybe more on the data side. So maybe perhaps they're a bit biased towards that direction as opposed to the old school side of things. But anecdotally, yeah, I, a lot of them say that they don't necessarily think that release point matters too much. And maybe it's not that release point matters too much. I think it really is that if the pitcher has good stuff, right? Good combination of velocity and movement from that release height, it shouldn't really matter again, a couple inches here or there in terms of how he's releasing because the quality of that pitch is so good. And oh, Shohei Otani is a really good example of this. There's actually some variation in separation between his, his pitches. And you could see this by looking at a release point chart of his, but his stuff is so good that it does not matter. I don't even think Otani has that great of command either. Most of the time, I really don't think he kind of knows where the ball's going, but his shapes are so good and his stuff is so good that it just works. And it, that's the problem with Bryce Miller, right? We run into the situation where he has really good stuff, but he's not doing what Otani is doing in that variance of release point for the most part. Otani's release variance isn't as large as Bryce Miller's, but again, this general principle, release point probably doesn't matter as much as just making really good stuff, but that's not the case with Bryce Miller. So I think it brings us to theory number two, which gets into two kind of phrases that I've heard a lot. One, does the breaking ball fit the pitcher's throw? And the second of that being, what is the break off the pitcher's arm angle? What I think both those phrases are getting at is essentially release point, a more nuance to release point. How the pitcher's getting to that release point, what his hand looks like at that release point. Is If the release point is consistent, is the hand placement different such that the hitter can pick up on it? Just more subtle nuance that potentially only hitters in the box can pick up on. And maybe on the public side here, we can't really measure outside of something like extension or release point, which are really the only two biomechanical factors that we have on the public side readily available. How you get to that release point, everything on how the body moves, how the body unwinds, where the trunk is, where the arm angle is. If the release point is consistent, you could run into a lot of variation elsewhere in the body that hitters might be able to pick up on. So again, theory number two is just the nuance of how you're getting to that release point could maybe create some differentials that hitters can actually pick up on as opposed to purely just a release point differential. And the best example I have of this is whatever the Dodgers did to fix Andrew Heaney's slider. They didn't give him a sweeper, contrary to what I hear a lot in the baseball space. They actually shortened up his breaking ball, his command jumped and poof, he's been an unbelievable pitcher since. And I think my theory here is that was purely a fit the throw or break off arm angle adjustment by the organization, mixed maybe with some command improvement, but the visual on that pitch must have gotten better for the stuff plus not to really have jumped a lot. So Bryce Miller sits in a very peculiar area where we have release point differential, but even if we don't believe in release point differential and we want to bet on stuff, I think we have a nice enough sample now between double A hitters and major league hitters of underperformance of both these pitches, such that you could assume something else is going on with how he's delivering the ball or what hitters are seeing visually, either in his body or in the actual pitch, such that the underperformance is striking below the stuff plus, such that I don't think we could expect just a correction back to stuff plus being 20% above average or so. So where do we go from here? We've had two theories on what's going on. Let's talk about two paths going forward. The first one is just locate the breaking balls better. Locate that gyro slider, locate that sweeper better. And the problem with this one is that I have no idea how you train command. And this isn't just because I'm not a pitch coach, I haven't worked with pitchers on a high level or anything like that. It's in conversation with coaches, the fact that I really have never gotten a great answer as to how you improve command. And so much so that you see smarter teams not adjusting pitchers for the most part, but going to adjust the targeting and adjusting the catchers. So adjusting the pitcher's sights as to where they're looking and hoping that everything just lands in the zone because we know how to maximize stuff pretty easily, but we don't really know how to maximize command. Maybe some organizations individually have nuanced metrics that allow you to project command out and maybe there's some drills with lower leg stability, front leg block stability, a variety of other things that maybe help it out. I think consistency in mechanics makes some sense in theory, although in practice, I'm not entirely sure if that's true. So I, command is great, right? I, I could tell Bryce Miller to throw those two pitches in the ideal spots and I think he'd have better results. But how to get him to that point is, I don't think something that we could just assume is going to happen. So that brings us to uh, path number two, 
which is just adjust the breaking balls, right? And this central question here that I find fascinating on the pitch design side is do you maximize stuff plus? Do you maximize the velocity movement of the pitch from that pitcher's fastball slot? So Bryce Miller, again, over the top, he's releasing that fastball from a high slot, getting a lot of backspin on the pitch. Do you maximize stuff plus on his other pitches from that slot? Or do you just maximize stuff plus generally? Do you just maximize it by going to a lower slot and going to that sweeper slot, which is five inches below the fastball and saying, that is objectively the better pitch by stuff plus. So let's throw that more often. And we assume that that will play out. We trust in stuff plus, And we trust that that pitch, even if it's coming from a lower slot, is just a better pitch historically based on historical comps, which is essentially what something like stuff plus is doing. Um, that The answer to that, I think, falls somewhere in the middle of those two points. But the problem, I think, is that Seattle, as an organization, being the organization that threw the most sliders in the minor leagues by a wide margin last year, is a team that I think chases stuff plus for the most part. So in a guy like Bryce Miller, I think they were just looking at differentials of slots or figuring out how he could get to a better breaking ball, saw him to the sweeper, which is, again, a big differential from that fastball, and just said, that's a great pitch. The movement and metrics on it are fantastic. It should succeed, but we're not getting those results. And the same thing with the gyro slider. He added that pitch. It's a little bit higher up than the sweeper, which makes a bit of sense, given a little bit more backspin on the ball. But again, we're not getting the results on the pitch. The results aren't good. So we maximized him on three different slots. What if you just took him from his four-seam fastball slot and figured out what the optimal pitch is from that slot? And that might result in just better breaking balls. Even if stuff plus is lower, you know, say that drops to 99 or 100. If you have better results on that pitch over an extended period of time, for a guy like Bryce Miller, maybe you have solved it. Maybe it is an adjustment off that four seam slot. But I think that's the question, right? Do you maximize a pitcher's stuff plus generally around the same slot? Or does that not matter? And should you just go to any slot, create the best stuff plus pitch you can? I don't know the answer to this. I'd be fascinated by what you think in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Kind of a think piece for me to talk through Bryce Miller and help me understand some of the nuanced concepts of what he's doing and why he's not getting any swing and miss on either of his breaking balls. It's a fascinating topic to me. Really curious to see how he finishes the season out. Thanks for watching.